The following is a keynote speaker presentation from the ACM 97 conference, The Next 50 Years of Computing. ACM 97 brought together over 2,000 leaders and luminaries from all aspects of the computing world to discuss and predict what the next 50 years of computing has in store. ACM 97 underwriters were Computer World, Hewlett Packard, Intel, Microsoft, and Sun Microsystems. Sponsors were Cadmus Journal Services, IBM, Netscape, Popular Science, Sheridan Printing Company Incorporated, Silicon Graphics Incorporated, SoftBank, and Unisys. The event also included a major exposition with a paleotechnic look back to the future from the year 2047 and a specially commissioned book, Beyond Calculation, featuring essays on the next 50 years of computing by luminaries and pioneers in the field. The ACM 97 conference was chaired by Robert Metcalf and emceed by James Burke. Details on how to obtain more information on ACM 97 follow this program. Ladies and gentlemen, James Burke. It's my great pleasure to introduce a speaker now who's going to take a very different look at things. She's, apart from anything else, an amazingly productive person. She has a list of books and papers as long as your arm, one of which is intriguingly entitled No Bad Dogs, but I guess we'll never know. Hmm. Anyway, she began life, so to speak, at the Free University in Brussels, Belgium, where after a number of years of reflection, she got her doctorate in computational reflection. In 1989, she took a visiting professorship at MIT and kind of never went home. And you can tell how serious she was about it, Brussels being the food capital of the world. Anyway, in 1991, she accepted a faculty position at MIT Media Lab, where she's now associate professor. She's also Sony Corporation Career Development Professor of Media, Arts, and Sciences. So far, she's worked on intelligent office systems, problem-solving strategies, object-oriented uh, knowledge representational languages, and computational reflection, as I mentioned before. And her most recent work is on a theory of action selection and learning in an autonomous agent using a distributed model. In 1995, she founded Firefly Network, Inc., in Boston, one of the first companies to commercialize software agent technology and to bring collaborative filtering technologies to community building on the web. You'll know, I'm sure, that the name of her game is Electronic Agents, what you might call the significant other of the 21st century, about which uh, and other exciting and unusual and sometimes disturbing things she is here to speak about today. On the topic, then, of how personal personal computing is going to get, please welcome Patty Mass. Okay. I don't know why we have such a fascination with anniversaries. Uh, personally, I get less and less excited every year about uh, celebrating my own. <laughs> Um, and especially we seem to have sort of this fascination with uh, zeros, anniversaries with lots of zeros in it, like 10, 20, 50, etc. I mean, it seems like it would mo make more sense for the ACM um, organization to celebrate the 32nd or the 64th anniversary rather than the 50th. <laughs> At least uh, computers would have had some chance of understanding what we're talking about. Um, but more seriously, I think that um, this is really a wonderful opportunity to sort of reflect on um, how far we've come and where we're going and whether we're really on the right track. And personally, my background is actually in artificial intelligence. And um, so I see this as an opportunity to uh, reflect about sort of what AI has done in the last 50 years, because AI is really as old as uh, computer science. And the first computer scientists like Turing were really the first AI researchers. 
Um, so I see this as an opportunity to reflect on where AI is going and whether we're go on the right track with AI. As you know, the goal of AI is to build intelligent machines. And um, there's actually a dual uh, justification for this research. On the one hand, we hope to uh, clarify or to, to get some insights into human intelligence by synthesizing uh, computational forms of intelligence. And on the other hand, we hope, of course, that there will be a lot of practical applications of these um, intelligent uh, machines. AI's holy grail is really a computer that is like a human, that is as intelligent as a human, like, for example, C3PO or HAL or uh, lots of the other examples that we know from uh, the liter literature and science fiction um, uh, movies. Uh, for example, uh, some of you may be familiar with the COG project at MIT um, where Rodney Brooks is basically in 10 years trying to uh, build a two-year-old, a robot two-year-old. Um, uh, this is the head of the robot. It, it has exactly all the same um, kind of uh, uh, degrees of freedom, the same sensors, two cameras, ears, um, everything uh, like humans have. And uh, the goal of this work is really to um, build a computer that can do what a two-year-old can do. There's lots of other projects like that one. Now, if I think, if I sort of reflect back and uh, look at what we've achieved in the last 50 years, then I'm actually very uh, disappointed. I think that um, we haven't really um, um, gained that many insights in, into human intelligence by uh, building artificial intelligence machines. And also, there aren't that many practical applications that we can point to. There isn't really such a, a big AI industry uh, today. So I wonder whether uh, maybe we've sort of taken the wrong path uh, somewhere. And um, I think maybe it may be as simple as reversing the acronym and, and working on what I call IA as opposed to AI. And by IA, I mean, or IA basically stands for intelligence augmentation. And what I would like to argue here today that maybe one is that maybe one of the futures that we should try to work towards is one where we don't try to build these standalone intelligent machines because as, as most of you know there's far more easy and more pleasant ways of reproducing human intelligence and uh, <laughs> But um, I think that maybe instead what we, what we should be focusing on is actually building combined forms of human and machine that are super, super intelligent and where uh, the human and the machine really uh, complement each other. So what I'm talking about really is uh, prosthetics and um, as people, uh, we have a history of inventing uh, prosthetic devices, um, for example, glasses, hearing aids, uh, voice synthesizers, uh, cars. I mean, all of you Californians um, would, would um, be completely invalid uh, without your cars. Um, <laughs> Uh, bicycles, I mean, all of these things have become part of ourselves or, and, and we really can't live without them. Um, so I'm arguing that we, what we should be working on is basically prosthetics for the mind. And you could say, well, why do we need prosthetics for the mind? And personally, I believe that there's a whole set of problems or bugs in our <laughs> minds. Uh, for one, we have lousy memory. We forget the names of people we met, what they looked like, where we saved the file, where we left our keys or our glasses, etc. I mean, imagine how much more efficient the world would be if we had better memory. Um, another limitation that we have is that we're only good at doing one thing at a time. We're not good at like multitasking or dealing with many different things. And of course, we can only be in one place at a time. Another limitation, cognitive limitation that we have is that we're very bad at dealing with logical reasoning, uh, probabilities. I mean, otherwise uh, we wouldn't have uh, these national, national lotteries or they wouldn't be as popular. Um, <laughs> we're very slow to process large amounts of information and there's a whole set of these limitations basically of our, our minds. Um, I have a lot of respect for 
mother nature but um, and, and sort of for uh, the capabilities of mother nature to evolve sort of a, a really good solution to every problem and every environment. But I personally believe that uh, there is currently a mismatch between our cognitive abilities and the environments that we live in. And this is especially the case actually for the digital world. So maybe uh, nature uh, and evolution hasn't really had time yet to catch up and sort of to evolve us towards um, uh, an entity that is uh, better adapted to dealing with this complex world. Uh, there's so many things that we have to keep track of. Um, we all are sort of are overwhelmed by information overload every day. Uh, we all have to learn more, remember more. Uh, so there's, there's really, things are getting more and more complex, or at least that's my feeling, that my, my world is becoming more and more complex. So if we think about um, sort of resolving this problem by building these combined forms of human and machine, then it becomes important to think about what the person should do, what the human mind should be used for versus what the prosthetics uh, should be doing. And I believe that computers and people are really um, good at, at doing very uh, different things. People are good at um, judgment, uh, for example, aesthetic judgment, uh, understanding things, um, reasoning, problem solving, being creative, etc. And computers still aren't good at these things at all. Um, computers, on the other hand, are good at a set of things that people aren't good at at all. For example, remembering a lot of facts, um, searching through large amounts of information, being in many places at once, or, and, and also doing many uh, things at a time, multitasking, basically. So um, for the last five years, really, since I, I joined the media laboratory, I've uh, undertaken this uh, sort of research uh, project, this um, intelligence augmentation research project. And we've built uh, a number of prototypes, first prototypes of such systems, of combined human uh, computer systems that, that could be said to be um, super intelligent. Um, some of these... Um, devices deal uh, with memory augmentation, they augment your limited memory. Some others sort of function as extra eyes or extra ears uh, for you. Others automate your, uh, some of the patterns in your behavior so as to save you uh, more time to do other things. Yet others help you deal with information overload or may help you with matchmaking, finding other people that have certain um, interests that you have. And finally, uh, we've done a lot of work also on transactions, um, computer entities that help you deal with um, uh, transactions of goods. So let me talk about each of these in a little bit more detail, although, again, I'll have to stay fairly superficial uh, because of the uh, uh, time limitation here. Um, you already saw the picture this morning of the um, MIT uh, geeks. <laughs> wearing their wearable computers. I'm waiting till they get a little bit smaller and more fashionable, personally. <laughs> but um, all of my students uh, these days basically walk around like this. And um, so they, <laughs> they, uh, they have these wearable computers, these computers uh, that they wear all the time. And um, I don't know whether they wear them in bed, but apart from that, they wear them all the time. And these computers have a lot of sensors that can sense what that particular student is doing. For example, uh, they have GPS, general positioning, so that they can keep track of where the student is going. Um, and basically, the software on these machines continuously remembers everything that they do. Um, it keeps track of every place they go to when they talk to each other. The machine keeps track of that. Um, it keeps track of what applications they're using at what times, who they get email from, send email to, everything, every, uh, every little thing they do sort of in the digital world as well as to the extent that that is possible, the physical world. Um, and what the machine does then is basically um, act as a, uh, an augmented memory, uh, uh, an extra memory. Basically, you can ask the machine to help you 
remember a certain person, a certain place, a certain action that you took, where you stored a certain file, uh, who it was that you met in the hallway on your way to the bathroom, um, and you think it was a Tuesday, etc. So you can ask questions like that, give the computer some information about um, sort of the, the, the fact that you're looking for, and the system uh, can help you retrieve that based on some contextual uh, information. Um, the system is also used to provide um, uh, just what we call just-in-time information proactively. So just like your own real memory, um, it sort of continuously reminds you of things related to your current uh, situation. In the same sense, this augmented memory continuously reminds you to things that are um, uh, related to your current uh, environment. So for example, um, if one of these uh, students is walking past the library in Boston, it may um, this uh, their um, little uh, monitor in front of their eye may give them some information about the current uh, exhibits or whatever that are going on in the library. Um, when I talk to my student, he automatically uh, sees all of my um, uh, recent email messages that I've sent to him, etc. So um, it's a little spooky sometimes <laughs> because these students seem a lot smarter than. And they really are because they always have access to all the right information at the right time. Um, so at the moment, the interface is really clunky. I mean, it's although it's sort of a geek stream, it's Emacs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm an Emacs user myself, but for some other people, it may look a little clunky, but it's really the best thing out there. But um, anyway. <laughs> Um, so what they see is, I mean, they do everything in Emacs and continue, they have this window at the bottom of their little screen in front of their eye which continuously gives them uh, reminders or reminds them of stuff that is related to their current situation and the current situation involves their physical situation as well as what they happen to be doing with the computer. Um, so, for example, email that uh, a person that they're meeting in the hallway has sent to them recently, etc. Um, another sort of area that we've explored is um, sort of using computers to basically give you extra eyes and extra ears to monitor the things that you really care about. Um, in this, um, and, and basically monitoring not just bits or not just events in the digital world, but also monitoring events in the physical world. Um, so we've been um, building, it's, it's really simple to build these things, but uh, we've been building little software entities that you can create and like leave behind somewhere at a certain database and they'll um, remind you or they'll tell you when, for example, your stocks have suddenly like uh, uh, fallen a lot or the stocks that you own or when a certain website that you care about changes, they'll, they'll sort of tell you about that. So it's as if you would have sort of an eye or an ear uh, placed in that part on that particular database and it's there continuously, continuously watching things that interest you and telling you about changes that occur. Uh, we're also doing this in the world of atoms, for example, embedding uh, sensors and computing devices in your fridge, for example, so that your fridge can monitor how much milk you have and remind you to get milk um, if, if uh, you're running low, or uh, you may want to have a little sensor at the coffee machine at your office so that, uh, that tells you whether there's fresh coffee or whether it's really old and you should stay away because you don't feel like making new coffee yourself. Um, so <laughs> we've, another area that we've explored is um, the automating of patterns in your behavior. This is a very early um, kind of system that we built. Basically on the right you see a little face that represents the agent, an agent, an eager assistant um, that continuously watches you dealing with this software application. In this case it's a meeting scheduling program, a uh, group work uh, program not unlike say Meeting Maker. And that little agent continuously watches you and will um, um, basically pick up some of the patterns in your 
uh, behavior and will then suggest to automate those patterns on your behalf. So for example, my agent may notice that I don't like to come in and have meetings before 9.30 in the morning, except if Nicholas asks for a meeting at 9, make, maybe I'll make an exception, Nicholas Negroponte, my boss, that is. Um, so it may pick up all of these regularities, which meeting rooms I like to uh, hold meetings in, how long I want certain meetings to be, and after a while, this agent suggests, can suggest to me to take over some of my meeting scheduling behavior because it has learned the way I like to uh, schedule meetings. Um, we've built a lot of systems, oops, a little bug in my slide there, um, a lot of systems um, that help you filter information, asynchronous ones as well as synchronous ones. What I mean by asynchronous or by synchronous filtering is basically um, agents that act as your online guide that continuously point you in the direction, in a certain direction that they think you will be interested in. For example, we've built a web browser that continuously watches what web pages you go to, analyzes those web pages, builds up a user profile, a profile of your interests. Uh, it may learn that you're interested in classical music, in that you're interested in certain keywords, in the fact that there's pictures at a website, whatever. And uh, the agent then, um, uh, basically um, will always act as an advanced scout. So whenever you are at a certain web page, it looks ahead and follows all the links of the current web page up to a certain depth and, and checks whether any of the pages in the local neighborhood are about, say, whatever topic it is that you are interested in or have those characteristics um, that you seem to be looking for. And then the agent points you in that way and says, I think you'll want to go that way because that's where the stuff is that you usually like. Uh, we've built asynchronous ones that like once every so often, uh, say once every day, check whether there's new information that may be of interest to you, again, based on um, a sense that the system has of what you are interested in. Uh, for example, at the uh, Expo, uh, you'll be able to um, look at the uh, Firefly uh, technology. Um, you can also uh, try this out yourself um, just using your browser and accessing this particular website. Um, and um, the Firefly technology helps you find not just uh, web pages uh, or rather websites that you may be interested in, but also movies, music, and soon also books, software, and a whole range of other um, types of objects. And it does that again by building up a profile of your interests and uh, suggesting things to you that it thinks you may be interested in uh, proactively as well as when you ask for it. So for example, my agent agent knows that I like, uh, say, Woody Allen movies, and so when a new Woody Allen movie comes out, the system will tell me about it. I don't have to go ask every week, like, are there any new movies that I would be interested in or read the papers or anything, but um, my, my sort of uh, information, personal information filtering agents um, are looking out on my behalf. Um, one of the problems that all of you um, I'm sure if, if is a, I mean, I think this is one of our most important problems that we deal with as people, although we never really acknowledge it, but is that of matchmaking. <laughs> um, for example, uh, finding a mate, it's very hard for us to um, communicate with another person, find out what they're like, find out whether that would be a good match, etc. We, we may spend 10 years doing that and then uh, spending another 10 years figuring out that it was the wrong mate after all or something. But, um, and this is really an instance of a more general problem, um, a more general problem that we have in sort of finding other people that have certain interests, finding other people uh, that are um, um, potentially, that potentially share our interests. We've been building um, matchmaking software, basically, not just for romantic matchmaking, but to solve this more general problem. Basically, in this model, um, we're hoping to make this available to whoever wants to download it very soon. Um, everybody has an agent, this little old lady, the Yenta, um, in the picture. Um, everybody has an agent that watches um, your email, your, uh, your web browsing, whatever you like it to look at, and extract some of the uh, interests that you have. Um, for example, it may learn that you're interested in scuba diving or classical music or whatever. Um, and 
these agents actually talk to each other so that they can take the initiative to introduce people to each other that share a lot of interests or that share some very unique interests. Um, all the same system is used when um, you meet someone to sort of create a link and, and tell the respective people uh, what some of the things are that you have in common, at least the stuff that um, you want to talk about sort of at the first meeting. Um, okay, whoops, sorry, went the wrong way. Um, and lastly, the um, one other set of um, sort of um, intelligence augmentation software entities that we've been working on is agents that engage in transactions on your behalf. Again, we have a website called CASPA, um, currently only accessible for MIT people, but we hope to soon make that available to the uh, world at large, a site where you can create agents, software entities that will buy something on your behalf or sell something on your behalf. Again, this is a very time-consuming process in reality, buying and selling, and a uh, very inefficient kind of process. We built a system where if you want to sell a second-hand computer, for example, you just, in a matter of a minute, create an agent by just filling out a form. You tell it that what computer you're selling, what the deadline is for selling that computer, the start price you want to ask, the minimum price you're willing to accept, how uh, that agent should negotiate on your behalf, whether it should be a tough bargainer or whether it should be very flexible in whatever sort of price it accepts, um, who it should be um, um, selling this to only local people or not, what, what its level of autonomy is, how often that agent should check back with you um, and tell you what has been happening, etc. And so once you create an agent like that, you can go off and do other things and this agent will negotiate with other agents of people that want to buy a computer on your behalf and will um, let you know when it has uh, found a, a deal or when it thinks that it won't find a deal in the available time, etc. And you can have as many of these as you want um, continuously acting on your behalf. It, gets, I think, even more exciting if you start putting all of these together, if you allow all these software entities to talk to each other and to collaborate. For example, um, if my, um, the agents monitoring the level of milk in my fridge could talk to my remembrance agent that is uh, running on my, my wearable computer, then um, when I'm driving past the grocery store, it could display a message on my little screen saying, you should go get milk or you should go run in and get some milk because uh, you're running low. Um, if my shopping agents, my transaction agents, talk to my matchmaking agents, then for example, if, I'm, if I just created a shopping agent to buy um, a SAP uh, car, um, uh, then um, it could actually look up who the other people are that are in that same process, that are trying to buy uh, and find a good deal for that same SAP 900. Uh, it could even, my shopping agent could even match up with these other agents and create create um, sort of a little uh, consumer cartel, basically, of all the people that want to buy a Saab 900, and they can go to uh, the Saab dealership and say, well, we'll buy 20 of them, but we need to, to get them at this price. So this is definitely less than 50 years away. Um, if my eager assistant um, talks to my filtering agent, and if my uh, say this eager meeting scheduling agent that schedules meetings on my behalf knows that I have a meet meeting with, say, IBM people, it could tell my filtering agents that um, I want to see some more stories uh, on IBM today because I want to appear as if I'm really interested in following what they're up to, etc. Um, <laughs> I am, actually. <laughs> so, what hardware and software will be involved in sort of realizing this, this picture of intelligence um, augmentation? In terms of uh, hardware, I think one uh, key component will be wearable computers. Um, so, as I said, they'll, they'll get much less clunky uh, than this. They'll basically become part of your glasses and the clothes that you wear, etc. Uh, but so it's important if you are going to have um, this, this, your intelligence augmented that 
it's always there. You don't want to leave half of your brain at home or something. Um, so ideally it would be implanted actually so that you can't leave it at home or forget it anywhere. Um, but until then we'll have to sort of integrate it in the other stuff that we're wearing on a daily basis. Another key component will be um, what we call things that think uh, at the Media Lab. And basically what we mean by that is that we want to embed uh, in, in everyday objects like um, toys, toaster ovens, doorknobs, etc. We want to embed sensors, cheap sensors, cheap processors and communication devices because if we're going to build these um, agents and, and these, um, this software that sort of can help you and that knows what you're up to, etc., and that can help you achieve your goals, then it's important that these systems operate not just in the digital world where things are easy to sense, but also in the physical world and that they can get a sense of where you are, what you are doing, and so on. Uh, so that's another component. In terms of software, I think a key um, sort of um, component will be, I mentioned it a lot already, agents, software agents. What we mean by software agents is really, I mean, it's, it's just software. There is no, no real magic there, but it's really a new way to think about software. It's software that is unlike today's software in that it is very personalized. It knows you, knows about your habits, your preferences, etc. It's very proactive. It doesn't just sit there and wait until you tell it to do something, but it actually tries to do things on your behalf and achieve some of your goals. It's unlike today's software, autonomous, uh, can, can act autonomously and is very long-lived and is just continuously running, uh, never is uh, shut off, um, hopefully. <laughs> um, and finally, it's very adaptive, sort of, and continuously trying to adapt to your changing interests and so on. Another key component of the solution um, for, on the software side will be uh, what we call digital ecologies. And by digital ecologies, we mean massive collections of machines as well as people, actually, that um, together can uh, solve certain problems or perform certain activities in a radically distributed way. And these kinds of systems are typically very adaptive. None of the components are critical. They're very robust. Any of the machines or people can be removed and the system still um, is able to perform. And a lot of the laws that sort of apply in nature will apply in these software ecologies and these digital ecologies as well. Things like competition, natural selection, and evolution. Don't really have time to go into that, but um, basically I think Sun has it right, the slogan sort of for the future is um, that the network is the computer. And uh, personally, I believe that we'll see more and more instances of what in a way we're seeing today here with these uh, little wands that we're holding up, namely that small efforts by many, many uh, people as well as machines actually will be used to solve certain problems and deal with certain issues rather than large efforts by very few. Um, and I believe that this will um, result in a way uh, of doing things that is more efficient, more adaptive, and more robust. Um, I would like to conclude, actually, by talking a little bit about some very important um, design challenges or UI challenges that we should keep in mind as we um, build uh, these devices. I think that these devices will only be adopted by people if uh, people can really trust this computer. Um, and trust, in this case, means understanding that the human knows sort of what um, the computer can and cannot do, and to some extent how it operates, etc. A second point is control. The human always still feels in control. You don't want this sort of computer, embedded computer running your life or something. You should still feel in control. And most importantly, um, last but not least, is uh, privacy. Uh, because once everybody, of course, has uh, these um, devices that continuously keep track of everything you do, everything you read, everywhere you go, etc. then of course it, it becomes really important that that information that is collected is, is safeguarded and that you are the only one um, that decides what happens or doesn't happen with that information. 
Thank you.